and neighbors and friends. Um, delighted to have you here in the Rosman Page Putnam Center for the Performing Arts, um, our brand new theater, which uh, opened technically in 2020, um, but then it kind of sat there for a while. Um, so it's been wonderful to, to use it for real and uh, for our dramatic reductions and other events. And I'm particularly delighted to to have you all here for tonight's President Speaker Series event. And I'm Michelle Perkins, I'm the President, in case you don't know, so the President Speaker Series was something I created actually about 12 years ago. Um, and we've been doing two or three, sometimes four, of these events every year. We, um, <clears throat> we were able to do an event in uh, last fall, um, and, and it was focusing on how New England College is going into the clinical medical field, we've just announced a nursing program, and um, and we had a bunch of uh, several alums who were in the medical field, uh, doctors actually, medical doctors, and we had our dean of nursing. It was very exciting. Um, I founded this event uh, as a way to celebrate the accomplishments of individuals, not necessarily alumni, but usually alumni. Um, and because I think it's wonderful for, particularly for students, to be able to hear alums who were here sometimes uh, not so long ago and oftentimes long ago, uh, particularly successful, accomplished alums, talk about how they did it and how they got from being a student where you are to the accomplished professionals um, that they are today. And so um, it was really, it's been really an exciting series. We've had um, some non-alumni here, including former uh, Governor John Lynch and um, uh, John Kasich we had one year. Um, but we've had other alums like um, Priceline.com uh, CEO and Chairman and NEC alum uh, Jeff Boyd. Um, we've uh, we had uh, Mike Michaels who, and, and um, <clears throat> Alexa Golden, both MDs, um, last time, um, and other um, really outstanding uh, alumni. Um, and so um, it's wonderful to be able to celebrate the MFA alumni this evening. Um, and I am here to introduce our special guests and our moderator, uh, Jennifer Militello. And as I thought about um, the speaker series, and I thought, I thought about the, celebrating the MFA, um, I, real, I was realizing how it was such a delight to be a part of the creation of the MFA with our founding director, Char Denord, who is uh, one of our special guests this evening. And, in, and even the, the delight in watching people create art, um, but creating the program itself, um, was reminded of the Shakespeare line that, that the artist gives to Airy Nothing, a local habitation and a name. And we really did that with the MFA. It was wonderful to see something come from airy nothing and become the wonderful, wonderful, inspiring program that it was and is. And so it's been, um, uh, we founded it in, I guess it was 2002, right, Sure. One. One, oh my gosh. Time, time flies, I can't even believe I was here then. Um, <clears throat> but um, it was just the, the most uh, amazing uh, founding and it's been uh, flourishing ever since. And we're delighted to have both our former director and our current director uh, with us this evening. So I am going to introduce uh, our special guests to you, and then I'll turn it over to, to Jennifer to interview the audience, I mean, interview the guests. And at the end, the audience will have an opportunity to, to ask questions. Um, so um, Jennifer Militello. Uh, is the author of The Pact, which is called Positively Bewitching by Publishers Weekly, and Stunningly Original by Green Mountain, Green Mountain Review, and memoir, Knockwood, uh, win winner of the Zang Nonfiction Award, as well as four previous collections of poetry. She's taught at Brown University, the University of Massachusetts Lowell, and serves as director of the MFA program in creative writing at New England College. She has a BA in English from the University of New Hampshire, an MFA in poetry from the University of North Carolina, Greensboro, and a PhD in creative writing from Basketball University. So Jennifer, I'm grateful that you're here this evening and welcome. Char Denord 
our founding director, is the author of seven books of poetry, most recently In My Unknowing and Interstate. He is also the author of two books of interviews with eminent American poets titled Sad Friends, Drowned Lovers, Stapled Songs, Conversations and Reflections on 20th Century Poetry, and I would like to if I could. He is currently Professor Emeritus of English and Creative Writing at Providence College. He is co-founder, as I mentioned, of the New England College MFA uh, in 2001, where he also served as the director until 2008. From 2015 to 2019, he served as Poet Laureate of Vermont. He has a BA from Lynchburg College, an MFA from the University of Iowa, and a Master's of Divinity from Yale Divinity School. Tara Betts is the author of Break the Habit, Park and Hugh, and the forthcoming Refuse to Disappear. In addition to working as an editor, a teaching artist, and a mentor for other writers, she has taught at several universities. She is the inaugural poet for the People Practitioner Fellow at the University of Chicago and founder of Whirlwind Learning Center. She has a BA from Loyola University, Chicago, an MFA in Creative Writing from Long College, and a PhD in English from Binghamton University. Howie Fairstein is the author of The Chapbooks, Play a Song on the Drums, he said, and Out of Order, and two full-length collections, Dreaming of the Rain in Brooklyn, and Goo Goots and Other Poems. A five-time Pushcart Prize nominee, he's co-poetry editor of Cutthroat, volunteers as a mentor at the Center for New Americans. He has a BA from Long Island University, also an MA from Long Island University, and an MFA in Creative Writing Poetry at New England College. <clears throat> and last but not least, Stephen Delbos, the first poet laureate of Plymouth, Massachusetts, is the author of In Memory of Fire, Light Reading and Small Talk. Awarded the Penheim Translation Grant in 2005, he has translated widely from Czech, including Teresa Rybakova's Paris Notebook and Vitislav Nerval's Woman in the Plural. Two of his plays have been produced, Ched Chetty's Lullaby and Deaf Empire. His scholarly work includes the New, England, the, the New American Poetry and Cold War Nationalism. He has a BA from Providence College an MFA in Creative Writing Poetry from New England College, and a PhD in Department of Anglophone Literatures and Cultures from Charles University. So um, please welcome our special guests, and I will turn it over to you, Jennifer, to begin the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, Welcome everyone, thank you so much for being here uh, and welcome to our guests. Uh, it is my honor tonight to have the opportunity to celebrate the origins of one of the most esteemed and one of the oldest low residency MFA programs in the country. Uh, we are very fortunate here at New England College to be able to, to celebrate this program in the way that we can. Um, when I came on as program director for this program in 2017, uh, I realized quickly that there was a lot of mythology surrounding this program um, and its founding co-director, Char Denord. Um, we all heard about its glorious past. We heard about the incredibly famous writers who had been part of the faculty. Uh, we heard some of the stories of the heyday. Um, and so even while we are here working to honor that legacy in the present um, by having writers on campus who are Pulitzer Prize winners and MacArthur geniuses um, and having faculty who most recently have won awards like the Whiting Foundation Award and an O'Henry Prize for the short story, um, it's wonderful to have the chance to hear about those days and what it was like tonight. Char, I'd like to begin tonight by asking you a bit about how the MFA program got started. Uh, what were those first few years like? How did you identify faculty and students 
Um, and how did you manage some of those logistics, the accreditation process, for example? Well, thank you, Jennifer. Um, well, just to put, I think sum it up, it was a was a miracle. And I don't know another way to describe it. I've written a little bit of the history here, so I, that I, I hope will give everybody some idea of how this uh, program came to be here at New England College. 22 years ago now, um, NEC President Hurwitz and then Vice President Michelle Perkins possessed the gumption, leadership, and belief in poetry to accept the crazy idea of founding an MFA program in just poetry with not one um, penny of seed money. How did this, that's what I said, it was like, it was like a miracle. Um, I'm trying to think of a comparable outrageous venture, which I actually can't, but President Hurwitz and Vice President Perkins went for it. They loved poetry enough to say, yes, let's, let's just do this, see, see what happens. Somehow my co-founder, uh, Jacqueline Jens, who had worked many years with Allen Ginsberg and helped start the Neuropa program, actually, um, joined up with me to start this program because it involved a lot more than just poetry. It involved all the logistics of, um, you know, of raising money, of, um, of finding room in the dorms, of being in close touch with the kitchen, um, all of these, are, um, nuts and bolts um, issues that we had to take care of, which um, took a huge amount of work. Um, but so we attracted enough students, uh, amazingly, 10 students, to lift the program off the ground in its initial year of 2001, about an inch or two. But there was, but there was air under it, growing in a growing balloon above filled with a helium of poetry. We were a poetry only MFA program, the only one in the country, the only single genre MFA program in the country, poetry, or just in any single, in any genre. We um, were passionate about our unique identity and purpose, as well as um, faculty rich. Our faculty included these poets. If you know much about poetry, or even a little, you recognize these names. Gerald Stern, Maxine Kuhlman, Charles Simic, Leon Lee, Thomas Lux, Bruce Smith, Paul McLean, Galway Cannell, Anne Waldman, Jane Mead, and this, this was just a few of them. The veritable embarrassment of faculty riches. In fact, I'd argue um, um, that our faculty was the very best MFA faculty in the entire country, including old established programs like Iowa. We doubled our enrollment each semester until by the time I left in 2008, 52 students, MFA students from around the world, uh, were enrolled in the New England College MFA program. How did this happen? Well, of course, the word got out. What a stellar program we were. But I needed to add, but I need to add that President Perkins who followed President Hurwitz about a year after we started the program, provided tuition scholarships to students, stalwart faith in the program, and just brilliant leadership. But perhaps most of all, she believed what the great modernist poet Wallace Stevens wrote about poetry, that life without poetry is life without sanction. So, what would or could a college or a university do without poetry? Although the MFA program at NEC today has different character and curriculum, faculty um, have come and gone, it continues under Jennifer Militello's brilliant leadership to provide the life of the college with sanction, not to mention the invaluable ongoing peripatetic education of creative apprenticeships its students enjoy and engage in, in the superb, uh, with, the, with the superb mentors here. We call them mentors rather than uh, teachers or professors. So thank you, President Perkins, for your two decades now of vision, guidance, ingenuity, and administrative savvy in keeping New England College's MFA program alive and thriving.
Thank you, Charlie. That's beautiful. Um, yeah, we are fortunate to have a president who is um, an artist herself. So, um, and without her, none of it would be possible. So, can you talk a little bit also, uh, maybe just briefly, about some of your favorite memories of the program as a, a curious person who's heard a little bit about that mythology? But we love. Where to begin? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Um, well, um, I, I can just remember we used to meet in the great room. Um, I don't know if that still happens. Yeah. yeah um, and just just to um, hear poets like Galway, Cannell, Charles Simic, Maxine Kuhlman, um, Ann Waldman just read and then meet with the students every um, every semester. They weren't here every semester, but but often enough was just seemed like a totally magical experience. And the reason uh, we started it as a single genre program was because you know, we believed that it was important that the program out, uh, that occurred outside or the, the discussions that occurred outside the, the classroom, um, in case you, you don't know how a single genre program works, I mean uh, uh, the residency programs work, students come here for 11 days twice a year meet the faculty, the rest of the time they're corresponding with them, we're sending their poems and writing back and forth about their poems, as well as essays. Um, but, um, to, but to meet outside the classroom and talk about poetry in the dorm rooms and the kitchen was just an invaluable conversation that, that went on. And I, and I really attribute that those conversations, and maybe some of our alumni can corroborate this, uh, to just the growing popularity and substance of, of the program and excitement about the program. So word of mouth, people heard about us and heard about this faculty and about this beautiful landscape here. It just started arriving <laughs> by the dozens from all over the, the world. Um, they will come. Greece, England, Japan. And we had to arrange travel arrangements mm -hmm. for these people every semester too, which is not it was it was fun actually. Yeah. <laughs> well and with that list of poets, yeah. uh, it's no surprise. And and I just add one more quick uh, response to your question. Um, what was so exciting was just, just to see the galactic leaps that the students made in their in their writing mm -hmm. while they were here. Maybe I hope Stephen and Tara and Howie can talk to that too, but just to but um, just to study, so I, we really envisioned the program as an apprenticeship first. Uh, we, we called it a program because we had to. But just to be able to work with these faculty, uh, and um, I, we, we ju I just saw the most amazing uh, progress in, this, in students' work, and I'm sure the same thing is still going on here. Um, so that was, that was perhaps really the most exciting thing to witness and to be a part of. Yeah, thank you. I think magical is a great term for that. I think that time that writers spend together um, exchanging ideas and thoughts and inspiration, um, it's a pretty special time and, and we're really fortunate. I should hold up our brochure. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> this it's is a the gorgeous first, This first. is the first brochure. Uh, I think uh, maybe it's the second Actually, the second semester. With all those but, famous uh, people. Look how, look how beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's like red, white, and blue. So, <laughs> it's uh, but uh, here, here's Paula McLean. She was here. Did I mention, you know Paula McLean? She's the best selling novelist now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She wrote The Paris Wife. Yeah. She was writing that when she was here. She, but she was a wonderful poet also. She wrote a great book called Lessing, or Lee Young Lee. Um, wonderful poet Bruce Smith, who's at Syracuse now, Anne Waldman, who's one of the beats with Allen Ginsberg. Um, just so, it, it, here's all the people, Tom Lux, who have tragically has passed away now, but, uh, so, that was, was fun to, so, you know, yeah, this is yeah. not cheap. <laughs> the, the school supported us. The school is incredible, absolutely. So let's um, talk to alumni for a bit, uh, because we'd, we'd love to sort of hear from them as well. Uh, how long have each of you been writing poetry, and when did you decide to pursue writing as your life, as your, as your profession? This is always a tough question. It's like, I was born to be a poet. Well, I think I knew I wanted to be a writer when I was a kid, actually. Um, and I do think 
my time at NEC was really valuable because at the time I was very much an activist dealing with a lot of the issues that have come up over the past two years other than COVID in Chicago. And I was a teaching artist. I worked with teenagers teaching writing workshops. So I had this really rich background in terms of reading the things that I loved, particularly in African-American lit, Latino literature, um, looking at people who had an activist background in terms of how that influences the craft of their writing. And I studied journalism too. So coming here felt like, okay, I want to look at some of the canonical texts, but I had a lot of room to explore some other things. Mm -hmm. um, I really got a chance to immerse myself in like Melvin Tolson. And, um, some people now will, you know, there was a young poet teaching here who had just got out of graduate school named Ross Gay. Who has now gone on to do a record with Bon Iver? Right, who's now incredibly the well collection. And then we were both living on the East Coast at the time when I worked with him. And, you know, we went and hung out for dinner, you know. And Ann Walden, you know, her neighbor is Patty Smith. She's like, come by the house, you can meet Patty. You know? <laughs> like, so to have those kinds of experiences to kind of bolster it, it made it social, but I also felt particularly as a writer of color, like that I could really explore the things that I wanted to say. And then there were some people, you know, as faculty who challenged me a little bit so that I could defend the aesthetics of my work, which I think is so important for young writers of color to be able to say, you know, oh, this is valid and this is why it's valid. And I felt like my classmates and the faculty encouraged me a lot in that respect. Fantastic. And then, you know, get to do stuff like play Scrabble with D.A. Powell. That was a lot of fun. Oh my goodness. It was like kind of scary because he's so good at it. But <laughs> you could imagine. You know? That man has every word ever invented in his head stored in there. Yeah. yeah. So if you haven't read D.A. Powell's poetry, it's phenomenal, you know, but definitely a vo vocabulary that's out of this world. Yeah. <laughs> Others? Howie? Stevie? I came into the program at a pretty late age, I guess. I wasn't the oldest in the program. I think there was someone who was in her 70s. I was in my late 50s. And it was time to get serious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been writing since I was young. Uh, I had written a couple, I think four or five plays, a screenplay, always a little bit of poetry. But I was ready to make a, you know, a, a real big move. And I loved the faculty, the people that were on the staff at the time I came in. I, I came out in 2006, so I guess I started in 2003 or something. Mm -hmm. and, um, right at the beginning. I worked with um, Alicia Ostriker and Joan Larkin and Michael Waters. Uh, terrific mentors. Uh, Jerry Stern was here and he was always, I guess, I idolized Jerry, so uh, I loved to be with him and talk to him. Uh, and it was just breathing in the atmosphere. And that community, that being, I mean, that's such a backbone of the program and it's so wonderful that, uh, that it always has been. Um, so maybe in that vein, any funny stories that you can remember that you'd like to share? I know I keep returning to this question, and maybe it's just, I'm, I'm always curious. We are, we're always hearing, like, the old days. Um, I remember one time we were coming out of Simon Center, and it was, it was when Ross first came here, it was in the wintertime, and this beautiful snow had come down while we were all in the workshop. And we just had a random snowball fight, like in front of the building. So that was like one of my fun memories. Yeah. Everybody's like, what yeah, you know. lots of, I don't know if you're supposed to, if we can advertise that kind of behavior. Lots <laughs> of river, uh, water, water play in the river and things like that. I remember one time we were here. Yeah, I should have been. Mike Huckabee came on his campaign tour, and Chuck Norris was the MC. Wow. Uh, okay. The, or something. And the uh, poster on campus was 
like a hole in the wall with Chuck Norris keep behind it, kicking through. Maybe, you know, like look, look up Chuck Norris. Or Walker, Texas Ranger. <laughs> Great poet, Chuck Norris. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, too much, I mean, just too much, too many fun stories to uh, recall. And uh, I don't know if the statute of limitations has, you know, gone off since 2008 yet, but, you know, I would just kind of, on combining the two questions, like I think some of the most valuable, uh, you know, experiences in the workshops and things, it was great to get the encouragement of, you know, people taking your work seriously, but, you know, also I had a couple, you know, particularly remember one workshop with um, Alicia Ostreicher and she was just like, no, nope, this poem does not work, you know, like, you cannot, you cannot get away with this. And uh, I was a little bit, um, yeah, you know, non plus at the time, but it was very valuable inside. And so, you know, I think alongside that atmosphere of taking the craft seriously and rising to the occasion, it was also the honesty of hearing, you know, it's sometimes for the first time, like, yeah, this is good, but, you know, no. think about this, yeah. you know, go back to the drawing board. Yeah, and that's really a form of support, isn't it? it is. And that's something I think over the years with the program, you realize that that kind of criticism is just as important, um, just as supportive as, as praise. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. That's, what, that's what you're looking for. Yeah. yeah. Tell me how to do this better. What's, what am I doing wrong? Um, get rid of those little words. <laughs> it's amazing how those few things stick with you and really, you know, I was saying earlier, sort of shape your style uh, forever. Um, and then too, I mean, if you work with people who all they do is tell you how wonderful you are, you should look at them with a lot of incredulous, like, you're suspect, you, you're really sus. I don't trust your opinion. Yeah. <laughs> like, you, you weren't telling me what I need to grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, you know, with the submission process, and, um, you know, you're, you're going to face a lot of rejection, and especially sending out to people that, and journals that, or presses that you have no connection with whatsoever. And so it really is so important that you, you know, get to a place of being able to get that honest criticism early on. And uh, like how we said, I mean, it's really, that's the valuable stuff that you, you want to get and uh, it can be hard to get sometimes. Absolutely. And Shard, how did you decide, you know, make those decisions that created this sort of perfect storm of, you know, we're talking about a really incredible community here. How did some of those decisions yeah, what, happen? It was a perfect storm, Jennifer. I, don't, I can't take, you know, full credit for it at all. I mean, just um, uh, to, to meet up with Jacqueline Jens, who had just quit working for Allen Ginsberg um, uh, and came to the Putney School where I was working at, at the time and working in the kitchen. And just after starting a conversation with her about where she'd been and who she knew and to tell me that she was Allen Ginsberg's, you know, um, former assistant and close friend was just pretty mind-blowing. I sort of said to her in the kitchen of the Putney School, you want to start a program? And she said, you know, she finally said, sure. And um, so it was so serendipitous. And then uh, my former teacher at uh, the University of Iowa Writers Workshop, Gerald Stern, said, knew Ellen Hurwitz, who was the president of New England College. And he mentioned this to her. He said, you know, these two folks want to start a program. How do you, how would you feel about it? It was about a year before, I think, um, Michelle Perkins came. Um, and then she said, yeah, let's, let's do it. And then, then we had to convince the board. I'll never forget sitting in the great room with just fear and trembling, talking to the board about training and then a program to do it. I mean, how are we going to make money? How are they going to support? I mean, I, I didn't have answers for any of that. And there was one particular guy who really grilled me, I remember. And, uh, but somehow they all finally said yes. And uh, then Jacqueline Jensen was just a genius at, at budgets and curriculum and all of the really, really work that was so necessary to start the program um, really pitched in, made me look good um, mm -hmm. in many ways. So I just have to give her a tremendous amount of credit. So, and then, and then they just, uh, you know, they all started coming. You know, Gerald Stern, 
was here. Mm -hmm. And then um, Maxine Kuhlman was, was here. I'll never forget studying with Maxine Kuhlman, who was talking about injection. She looked at, although that was, this was before the program started, when I was coming up, she was reading one of my poems, and she looked at it, so it's a little short lyric, and then she looked up at me, and she looked back at the poem, and then she looked back up at me, and then she said, Char, this is exactly what gives poetry to that game. <laughs> <laughs> and, but that was, that was the medicine that a lot of the faculty had here in, in, in their own inimitable way of delivering it. But, uh, so, so then you know, Paula McLean came because Bruce Smith knew her, and Bruce Smith was one of my closest friends. And um, so it was just this incredibly magical congregation of friends. This incredibly magical congregation of friends. Liam Lee. Um, and, uh, so, and, so I don't know if this could happen again, but just the moment, you know, in 2000, 2001, no. It was a nice generational mix, too, but to have some of the younger writers and then to have somebody like Maxine, you know. So they were in Warner, by the way, just down the road. Yeah. yeah. And um, I think some people, even when I was a student here, they didn't know that Maxine Kuhlman and Ann Sexton were best friends. You know, and so they were like, what? I'm like, yeah, they workshop together, you know? And to know, and for me as a woman too, I felt like this program was really bad. Because there were so many powerful women in the program, like Anne and Paula and Alicia and Maxine. And before I came here, Marilyn Nelson was here. I had worked with her a little bit. So for me, that was really important too, to just see that kind of, dedication to the craft, people who had published tons of books, things I wanted to read, mm -hmm. who also could kind of go, you know, and be a little bit of a bumper car to some of the masculine energy. Because yeah. <laughs> even if everybody's getting along, sometimes you gotta, no. <laughs> you gotta remind each other that we hold each other accountable too. Yeah. You know. Just as far as there are these folks' national recognition, about 80% of them, or maybe even a little more, were all Pulitzer Prize winners and National Book Award winners. Yeah. Do they still give out the tambourine at the end? There was some photos that went online recently. Somebody's <laughs> There's a tambourine? Yeah, yeah. Um, after, uh, the last day, I guess. Yeah. Okay, this is the sort of stuff I want to hear about. Yes. There's a tambourine from whoever held it for this residence to someone who would be here for the next residence. Someone who would Oh, yeah. Be here the spirit. The yeah. Passing it's on. It's like the spirit of right. Okay. Yeah. So if you're not doing that, I think I. I, I it's I time to start again, yeah. obviously. Yeah, that's, that's, that's on my list. Jennifer, you were asking about moments like these funny moments or just memorable moments. One of the great times we had here was um, everybody would pile into buses, or first it was just a bus, um, and travel out to themselves. Um, and it, which is um, John Hayes' former house on what lake is that? It's um, Sanapi. Sanapi, yeah, it's on Sanapi. Okay. For for readings, and we'd arrive at this mansion, which is a in a park now, and there would be Charles Sinek <laughs> to read to us. Incredible. Who was hysterical, and, but also deeply you know, and, and intelligent and masterful as a poet. Jerry, um, read, Jerry read that same day. That's right. So to like be able to go to the Fells, which is just down the road, you should all go there, and just to hear these folks read there in that setting, it just it get magic. One time we went up to Amherst and Jerry Wren at Amherst and Jack Gilbert was there because he was living in Amherst at the end of his life. And, you know, Jerry has that great poem, The, the Red Coal, about being in Paris with Jack Gilbert in the, in the 50s or whatever. That was incredible. Um, one moment I always come back to, Chris Hedges, the great journalist in the tradition of George Orwell, I think one of the great living um, English language journalists, uh, you and Chard invited him to give a talk in the great room, and it was, uh, yeah, one of the most powerful public speaking experiences I've ever had. He was vivid and, uh, yeah, talking about his wartime experiences and his love of poetry and how the two 
intersected under the most violent uh, circumstances at times. It was, you know, something I uh, I still semester after semester uh, quote to my students Chris Hedges and uh, thought terminating cliches was this idea that he was talking about uh, wow. things like collateral damage, yeah. thought terminating cliches. And, uh, yeah, totally unexpected. Not a poet at all, you know, but. Um, I, you knew him or, or you know, know him, and yeah. it was a totally unexpected treat and something I still think about all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's nice to hear. So maybe as a way of um, kind of winding down our questions before we move to questions from the, the audience, um, how are you inspired now in your lives to do the writing that you're doing? Who are some of your favorite poets? Um, and what advice would you give to students who are thinking about creative writing as uh, their life and, and their, you know, their next step and are maybe thinking about, and I'm a fan of this, a three-tier question, but I think they're really related. Sorry, okay, let's start. <laughs> um, so where do you find your inspiration? Who are your favorite poets? We'll start there. Oh, gosh. It's always poets at this point. Um, I would say that people I go back to are different from the people who I'm excited about right now. Like, I'm excited about Denise Smith. I love their work. Mm -hmm. um, I really like Nessie Birdsong, who just came out with her first novel. So she's a double threat. Um, and who else have I been reading as of late? I have a big stack of poetry books on my bed, so I keep collecting new ones. Um, my favorites have still been, I love Marilyn Hacker, I love Marilyn Nelson, uh, Patricia Smith has been somebody I've studied for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, I love Sonia Sanchez, I love, like, I could just go on and on, <laughs> but in terms of my inspiration, I pull from a lot of different places, I like music a lot, mm -hmm. um, recently I've been writing stuff about Alice Coltrane, because everyone talks about John, but his creative collaborator was Alice. And so much of her story, in terms of her spiritual journey, in terms of her journeys as a mother and a musician, is just ripe for poetry. And it's something I've been thinking about for a while. Um, so music, for sure. Sometimes other art forms, I love looking at visual art, and writing a phrasing poem when you mm -hmm. write in response to the work, mm -hmm. or just going for a walk. Like, I didn't realize, you know, I've started talking to my students about that. Like, you're always going to read a poem by somebody where they're looking out the window. You're always going to read a poem by somebody going for a walk or they go out for a drive. And I think it's because the way our minds work, like, we start to see things moving, or you see it like you're in your own movie, and then you're like, oh, that's the poem. I see it. I hear it. And then you're like looking for that notebook, trying to get it down before <laughs> you forget it. You know. So I think I'm starting to draw more from that than anything else. But how is that? I run a uh, poetry discussion group, a facilitate group that we meet every week. Uh, through the library in Northampton, Massachusetts. And right now it's Zoom, of course. It used to be in person. So a lot of the, I guess I would say, I'm inspired by a lot of the poets that we pick each week. I make up a packet of 10, 12 pages of poetry. Like uh, Larry Levis last week and Larry Levis this week. Uh, I mean, that, that'll keep me going a bit more. Mm -hmm. So, and, and then also Smith College is in Northampton where I live. They have a reading series at least once a month. Somebody's there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, that, and that's another form of inspiration. Yeah, for me, uh, there's this quote by Auden that something like, you know, poets over 30 are bound to be voracious readers, but they probably don't read very much poetry. Um, <laughs> and I feel the same, you know, similar way. I, like Dennis Smith, for sure, like, you know, there are so many incredible poets writing these days. 
Um, and, but uh, yeah, I read a lot of biography, I read a lot of artist biographies, poet biographies, history, related to like Cold War history. Um, but uh, as Poet Laurie in Plymouth for the last couple of years, I've been working a lot with, uh, with high school kids and the elderly and developmentally disabled people in, in town. And, they have really become kind of my favorite uh, poets. So like Emily and Sally and mm -hmm. Cynthia and Andrew are, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, up, up on the list. Emily the other day wrote this line, um, hear the sounds of flowers when wind touches them. Mm -hmm. I just thought, wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah the synesthesia, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, but um, always looking for inspiration, always just trying to, uh, Keep that hard gem like flame glowing, as Walter Cotter talked about. Um, and yeah, having the notebook and just trying to never let uh, a word slip by. Yeah. Mm. I'm into, I think about obsession a lot now. Like, I, and I was talking with my poetry students, I have now about that. Like, there's so much stuff that poetry, it can be the container for what you want to talk about, but it doesn't like give you some of that foundational information. It's like a different kind of yeah. emotional intelligence. So I'll be like, I just tell my students, what are the topics that you think have nothing to do with, po with poetry that you're obsessed with? And I've been like, yeah, other than music, I like comic books, particularly X-Men. I'm really <laughs> into X-Men. Um, or just like a particular type of mythology, or now I'm studying herbal medicine, so it's like, all of that can feed into the yes, poems. Into the poems yeah. You find the metaphors in it. You know, you can watch David Attenborough documentaries, and there's poetry, yeah. books of poetry in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that, in and of itself, is I think some some great advice for for students and audience. So, mm -hmm. so why don't we take a few questions from the audience at this point? Anyone has anything they'd like to ask? Wouldn't that scary? I promise. <laughs> Don't TikTok me. That's all I have. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Do you have uh, any of you have uh, experienced like the fear of failure? Oh, I didn't like that. <laughs> uh, have any of you? Can you? Yeah. Uh, experienced the fear of failure, and what advice would you have for you know somebody who writes, whether it's poetry or anything else, that just doesn't like go for it? Because they might feel that. Yeah, I mean, it's a, that's a real real thing for sure. I mean, I uh, felt the fear of failure 40 minutes ago when we were sitting there about to get on the stage. Uh, you know, over preparation is always my antidote to nervousness or something, you know, when it comes to a, a, an event or, or what have you. Um, you know, but I think at the end of the day, it's like, especially with something, you know, especially in the creative arts where um, I think it's important to take yourself very seriously and not take yourself seriously at all. You know, and to do it well, you have to be completely committed and everything has to be at stake, but you also have to realize that, you know, absolutely nothing is at stake. And if you don't write this sonnet properly, there's gonna be no negative consequences in the world, you know? And so I think there's a balance to be found of believing in yourself, you know, but also, keeping the larger picture and that, you know what, um, my fear of failure is totally inside my head. Uh, nobody's ever paying as much attention to you as you are paying attention to you. And, um, you know, and just, um, especially with poetry and again, the creative arts, it's like everyone is in it to be positive and expressive and communal and, you know, and it's important to remember that we're all in the same boat, essentially as poets, as artists, as human beings. Um, and yeah, just that kind of humanity of it, that everyone's kind of feeling the same way, you know? I do think it's a, it's a hard boat to row. I'm not gonna pretend that it's not. Um, I've always juggled a bunch of different things to make it happen, but throughout, to speak to your question, I think more often than not, it's been me defining what success looks like for me and what failure is not going to be. Like, if I don't get into this journal or if I'm not invited to this party, that's not going to make or break what I want to do because I've always wanted to write. 
you know? And I hate to be like that do what you love type of thing where people tell you to do it and you're like, no, it's nice to get paid for it. It's nice to get invited somewhere. But what is my backup plan and what are strategies I can use that let me do that, whether you let me in the door or not, right? Like I keep thinking of um, so our new Supreme Court Justice, Ketanji Jackson, and whether she got on the Supreme Court or not, you can't deny that she's eminently qualified as a legal expert in this country, right? So even if she didn't make it, you know, and I'm glad she did, but even if she didn't make it, she's probably one of the most qualified justices we have in terms of what she has on paper. So I think about those kinds of examples that it's like, yes, I have this opportunity to write. I may not win the Pulitzer ever in my lifetime. I may not teach at Harvard or any of that, you know, big lofty stuff that people think poets are supposed to do. But I'm writing. I'm here. I keep trying. I keep submitting. I keep putting it out there. And sometimes that's all you can do. You know, Thomas Beckett said, what? Fail again, fail better. Fail. Fail again. Fail better. <laughs> Other questions? Somebody hit me. Until you uh, achieve success, um, how do you pay the bills? <laughs> Yeah, sorry, the question. Uh, exactly. Well, I have a job. I'm not going to pay the bill. Yeah, the poetry won't, won't pay the bills, probably. But, uh, I mean, you know, for me, somehow, um, it, I, so, uh, Franz Kafka, a great writer, his, uh, his friend and editor, Max Broad, said that art and breadwinning must be kept separate. And um, somehow that just seemed natural to me, and I never really expected to be able to, or didn't feel, you know, entitled to make a living off of uh, off of poetry, or really, you know, creative pursuits. You know, as Tara said, it is nice to be compensated and invited places and things like that. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. For me, poetry it's a way of processing the world. It's a way of engaging with reality and language and tradition and community and humanity. It's a way to be in touch with one of the oldest traditions of humankind. You know, it's poetry is one of the things we've been doing longest as humans. You know, poetry and fire are there pretty close together. So when you read a poem, you open up a time capsule. And when you write a poem, you know, you contribute your verse, right, as Whitman said. So it's really more of a privilege to be able to kind of study the craft and be a part of it than it is um, a money-making pursuit, in my opinion. I agree with Stephen. I mean, you know, my mother had to work a really hard job for me to be able to go to college in the first place. And I had to go on. I mean, that's part of the reason why I ended up at NEC. They actually gave me a partial scholarship to go here. And for me, it was always, like I said earlier, combining strategies. I came out of, like I said, poetry slams. I made my own books before I published an official book and sold those out of a backpack for a long time. I think there were a couple times I actually paid rent because my rent was that low. I had a tiny apartment in Chicago, and I paid rent selling chapbooks. Um, and now we've moved into a whole different electronic era where you can design, edit, publish your own book, and get a box in the mail, print all your own merch, bring the square, drop it on the table, and say, yes, I can accept Google Pay, Apple Pay, credit cards, chips, you know, and I think that's a different mindset from the beauty of it and the emotion of it, which is what I think Stephen describes so beautifully, you know, and you eventually need, like, help. you got to talk to people and be ready to do business. That's not the same heart, you know, so I think I kind of, like, for me, because it has helped me as a single person, 
who's like living in a major metropolitan area to think about it sometimes, but I do that after the book is done. Like I can't, I have to separate it out. Well, I, I think it's, a, it's important to notice historically here that MFA programs are relatively new in right. as far as the, as far as the history of education in this country. The first one was started in Iowa in the 30s, and but there weren't many after that. So in the beginning of the 60s and 70s, um, maybe even the late 50s, um, universities started to accept them as, um, uh, as, as, as viable and important uh, courses of study and degree programs. Um, so a kind of professionalization has happened with MFA programs since the 60s. People go to MFA programs expect to get a job, to earn money, you know, as it was after graduate. It's pretty hard uh, to, to do that. And I think that it's important to do something else uh, and, and, and to write. Uh, if you think of the, some of the greatest poets that America's ever produced, T.S. Eliot, William Carlos Williams, Wallace Stevens, they all did other stuff. They, Wallace Stevens was an insurance man. Eliot was a banker. Um, and... Um, W.C. Uh, w. Williams, William Carlos Williams, was a doctor. So they did something else, and look, they produce an enormous amount of work, so you can do something else. You don't have to follow the professional course um, as, a, as a writer and become a teacher. Um, it's certainly not going to make much money writing poetry, uh, selling books of poetry. There are only a few who have done that recently. Um, so, um, so it's actually better in many ways to do something else, to find something else that you're passionate about, as well as to write, because that other thing can become really vital subject matter for you. True. I, you know, I would just add to this, sorry, on a very practical level, though, having said what I said before and agreeing with whatever everything that's been <clears throat> said, you know, once I had the MFA, then I was able to get a teaching job, teaching undergrad, you know, and then. Um, went on to do a PhD and that's opened up more teaching and even just the study of language on a very close, uh, you know, close level, close reading and really breaking down language and learning about how it works and how it can be crafted has um, opened up doors for me in writing and editing and, you know, content management and essentially everything that I do now, one way or another, you know, could be traced back to the MFA. Right. And it's... It's kind of like you get transferable skills doing the, you know, like I've seen so many stories like in Forbes magazine where they're like, now they want to hire creative English writers language. because yeah. nobody yeah. can write a memo or an email that makes sense. And <laughs> you're like, wow. Um, but to add to that level of transference, the thing that I'm really excited about in American literature in general is you're seeing a lot of these younger poets who have gotten so hip to the game, you know, in terms of, I can write poetry, well, I can go write a novel. Like I think about Elizabeth Acevedo or um, Julian Randall or Eve Ewing. And these are all young people that I saw when they were in high school and they're writing novels, they're writing nonfiction and then they go, okay, here's my poetry book too. And I think Paul poets are so good. And Paula McLean was doing that. I mean, when I worked with her, she had the poetry book and the memoir. Yes. I didn't know she was working on The Paris Wife. Uh -huh. But her writing, if you can just write, yeah. like you're an intense but good writer. Like, Paula made me want to write prose. <laughs> you know, and I'm slower than all these other people. But <laughs> I definitely think poets, you know, have so much hustle usually in terms of getting their work out into the world, it doesn't surprise me when poets say, yeah, I'm working on a novel. Because you learn how to economize words yeah, and to get your ideas across in some really powerful ways. 